So I'm Alan Delapen. I'm branch head for injury and violence prevention at the Division of Public Health. I want to welcome you to our second virtual uh, OPDAC meeting. Uh, if you joined us a couple of weeks ago for our first one, we're we're trying to shift our format in this virtual environment that we all seem to be in for a while here and. We're trying to hold roughly monthly meetings, a little bit shorter format, a little bit more focused on specific topics. So last month was adjustments that are going on in the treatment world uh, in association with COVID and things that have happened. This month, we're gonna focus on syringe service programs and harm reduction. Uh, programs and a lot is going on in that corner of the world also and we have a real exciting panel of speakers and presentations and hopefully you all get to learn a lot about what's going on and maybe make some new connections. So I first of all want to thank the panelists for uh, their generous use of their time to join us. Uh, we're getting support again this time from the Governor's Institute for Substance Abuse uh, and the team has really been helping us bring this meeting in a virtual format. So thank you very much, Governor's Institute. And behind the scenes, as always, is Sarah Smith on our team who's helping keeping it all coordinated. So I appreciate that very much. Um, we, we're, we have, everybody's now probably super familiar with doing Zoom and other virtual format meetings and every group has sort of its culture of how you go about doing things. OPDAC we've tried to have is a collection of colleagues and friends and when we're in an OPDAC meeting we try to take a few minutes of time at the beginning and do an introduction partly as people can make connections and go oh that's that's who that is. I'd like to connect with them. It's a little harder in that virtual environment to make that connection. So our way of doing it is to do a poll uh, and kind of give an idea of who's in the room, give a chance to see the variety of folks that uh, at least their discipline that they represent. So Sarah, is that poll available? It should be coming up momentarily. Okay. So when the poll comes up, there you go. Just take a few minutes and uh, kind of show who you feel like the discipline that you're from and if other if, if you don't see yourself represented on that uh, list of choices there go ahead and put in the chat who, who you are and what group you're with because again it, it helps the, the panelists know the disciplines or the kind of point of view folks are coming and it also helps us kind of calibrate where we're going and know who else is in the room so go ahead and take a few minutes to fill that out while you're doing that, uh, I'll also mention uh, part of what we try to do with the panelists is give chance at the t end of each session uh, questions and answers. So if we were at, over at McKemmon Center, we'd have mics out and y'all get a chance to walk up and raise your hand and have a dialogue back and forth. How we do it in this environment is through the chat. So if you have a question, whether at any time during the, the meeting or specifically during a panelist, just put your questions into the chat or your comments. We have members of the team that are monitoring the chat. In some cases, they'll try to provide a response within the chat or resources, because there's a lot of good resources out there that folks might not know of, or we'll, during the open session of the, the presentation, we'll give a chance to uh, ask your questions during that session. I'm trying to answer the poll, there it goes. Um, so the the other thing that I wanted to say up front here is like, like uh, we have a theme for today, it's harm reduction syringe services. Uh, North Carolina has a really rich history with harm reduction. Uh, a lot of the legislation early legislation over the last five or 10 years that have helped us address the uh, current overdose epidemic that we're in kind of comes from the work of the North Carolina Harm Reduction Coalition and a whole array of affiliated partners with the naloxone legislation, the syringe service legislation that happened in 2016, and having a space to reduce the burden of death and find a pathway into a safer, healthier life through harm reduction and syringe service has been a hallmark of what North Carolina has accomplished. We've looked at the data. We certainly had a lot of people we lost during the height of the epidemic a couple years ago, but we didn't suffer the deaths 
nearly as severely as some of our neighboring states. And I think it's the robust network of having harm reduction services out there and reducing, you know, giving folks an opportunity for overdose reversals and continuing to work with safe syringe programs. So a little bit of today is to spotlight how programs are adapting to the COVID environment, but also to learn a little bit more where we are. We're now into our third year of, of legal syringe services in North Carolina. We have a, a legacy of underground programs before that. Uh, North Carolina is doing a lot to address uh, healthy, safe syringe services. We think we have the largest program in the South, maybe one of the largest in the country. And we want to, you know, we've had support from the department and the General Assembly to continue to provide support for this service. So this morning is really a collection of panels and discussions to learn more about syringe services and, and harm reduction, but also where things are headed in this COVID environment. Our uh, first presenter we'd asked is Alyssa Kitlis, who joined our, our branch at the Division of Public Health earlier this spring. I, I, it seems like she's been with us for a long time, but she joined us after the COVID environment started, taking over the work that Lily Armstrong started in our office. So she, she leads the, from the Division of Public Health, she leads the effort uh, for the work that we do in syringe services, but by no means, I think she would say she runs the program. She coordinates a large connect work, connection and network of partners with us. So I turn it over to Aly Alyssa, thank you. Great, thanks so much, Alan. And as Alan mentioned, my name is Alyssa Kitlis and I'm the Community Overdose Prevention Coordinator with the Division of Public Health. And in that role, as Alan mentioned, I support the North Carolina Safer Syringe Initiative, which means, um, I coordinate with a number of people to work with programs as they're looking to register their, their syringe service program with the state. I help support the annual reporting process where we track key metrics that um, and the work that's happening across the straight state. And we're gonna be sharing some of that annual reporting uh, data with you here shortly. And I also connect uh, programs to technical assistance through connecting with partners and resources and our technical assistance leads. And I wanted to provide a little bit of a background and an overview of where we are with syringe service programs here in North Carolina. But I wanted it to be relatively brief because we, as Alan mentioned, have two really amazing panels where you'll be able to hear from the folks doing this work across the state, but wanted to provide a little bit more context as we get started to frame the conversation. So as of today, we have 40 programs registered in the state. And that means that they're, I mean, they're coming in all the time. Two actually just registered within the past month and one started operating last week. And so this number is continually evolving and growing. And through the 40 programs that are registered, we have 55 counties that are served directly. And you can see on this map that is the, those are the counties in blue. And when it means serving directly, that's where programs are either operating a physical location or a fixed site or integrated within another program, or they are um, providing services through mobile and delivery-based services. And so those are the counties that are directly reached, but the reach of the 40 registered programs goes well beyond um, those counties. And I mentioned the 55 counties and also one federally recognized tribe, the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. And then in terms of additional counties reached, there are 24 counties that you can see with the white and the, the blue kind of um, diagonal stripes in it. And then actually nine other states and one country that are served. And what that means is that individuals who live in those either neighboring counties who don't have direct access to the SSP in their community are able to still access services by traveling to that um, county. So the big takeaway here is that the map continues to grow in terms of what counties are covered and supported and just the extensive coverage across the state. And SSPs in North Carolina are operated by a range of different partners. We included a list here, but they are made up of um, organizations run by directly impacted or individuals with lived experience, a lot of community-based organizations run programs, but also we have a number of SSPs that are set up in local health departments run by faith-based organizations and health systems in substance use treatment pr programs, as well as aid service organizations, and even first responder and EMS-based EMS services. And that is really 
pretty unique to North Carolina because of the way that our law was established in 2016. And it's a really exciting component of the work that's happening here. And you can see in the bottom right hand corner a link to the list of all the registered SSPs in the state and Megan also shared it in the chat box. But that's a great opportunity to really look at county by county what programs are operating and see contact information and just to note as I mentioned earlier that list continues to grow and evolve and so those two new programs aren't on there yet but will, will be added soon so definitely encourage you to check that list out but continue to, to look at that because it is updated as more programs start and programs expand their services. Next slide please. And one thing I think that is going to really become apparent in this conversation, and I think you all are pretty familiar with this already, but certain service programs are a really critical touch point and um, partners and connecting point within their community. And so we'll hear a lot about this um, in the two panels, but certain service programs, I think sometimes we start by thinking about the services they provide as the syringes and other injection equipment that are distributed, syringes that are collected and disposed of, um, and naloxone that's distributed as well, but really they're providing a range of support and connection and services beyond um, just those core services. Next slide, please. Thanks, Sarah. So this maps out just um, a range of services that are provided. So starting with the core services, most I would say all programs, because this is outlined in the law, provide um, the core syringe and supply access, as well as syringe disposal, naloxone, whether it's distribution directly through the program or referral to naloxone in community partners such as pharmacies, educational materials and trainings, in key issues such as infectious disease prevention and overdose prevention, as well as referrals to mental health and substance use treatment. So that are the core, those are the core services that are being provided at SSPs. But really, there are such a range of other ways that SSPs are supporting their communities and participants. And this really varies depending on the program, and you'll hear a handful of examples today. But I wanted to highlight some of the ones that stand out and, and that are really important to note. So a lot of SSPs in North Carolina are supporting their participants through, as we mentioned, education and connection to not only mental health and substance use treatment, but a range of medical services, social services. Um, there are even some programs have post overdose response teams. A number of programs are providing wound care, either directly or through partnerships with uh, nurses at federally qualified health centers or in health departments. We have a lot of programs that are connecting folks to medication assisted treatment or MAT, um, either through that linkage, but we're gonna hear today about programs that are starting to offer a low threshold uh, buprenorphine um, on-site induction at the SSP itself, as well as hepatitis C treatment. So we're really seeing not only a range of additional support and services, but a growth in what is available. And some other services that are pretty central to what SSPs are doing are offering HIV and hepatitis C testing and linkage to care. Um, and we're also hearing about programs that are offering training and professional development, connecting individuals to pre-exposure prophylaxis for HIV prevention, uh, expanded sexual health services, as well as connecting people to food, housing, and this list is not at all exhaustive and I'm sure there are plenty of other things that are going on, but really wanted to just highlight that there's just such a wealth and range of um, resources and support that are being provided by SSPs and they're really important partners um, beyond just the core services that they provide. Next slide, please. Great, thank you, Sarah. So we mentioned this earlier, but one of the key components of the North Carolina um, Safer Syringe Initiative is that we conduct annual reporting to track metrics and programs and really see the range of services that are provided. And so, this is a little bit of a sneak preview. We haven't released the 2019 to 2020 report yet, but we'll be releasing it in the next week or two and we'll share it out over this listserv. But wanted to highlight some of the main metrics from the report um, and just really highlight the incredible work that's happening across North Carolina. So between 2019 and 2020, 
over 15,000 unique individuals were served by these programs and that includes over 62,000 total contacts with um, participants and this represent represents over a 50% increase from the year before. And as you can see, just really pretty significant growth over the last four years since legalization in 2016. Next slide, please. And this is my favorite slide. And I just want to take a minute to um, shout out all the folks who are working at SSPs or volunteering at SSPs in the state just for the incredible work that's happening. So over the last year, over 5 million syringes were distributed and over 53,000 naloxone kits were distributed, which Alan mentioned is really pretty significant and definitely, we think, um, one of the most developed programs um, in the region and, and probably, I mean, nationally for sure. So definitely want to applaud all the work that's happening and just highlight the significant increase that's happened over the last four years in terms of access to syringes and naloxone that is available through uh, partner and work that SSPs are doing. And one other thing I wanted to point out is that over the last year, um, 8,600 overdose reversals were reported back to SSPs, which is about a doubling from the previous year. And we know that that is not all the overdoses that um, were reversed through community-based distribution that takes place at SSPs. Um, but just wanted to highlight, you know, there are definitely more lives saved through this work, but that is a really significant number and just wanted to make sure to highlight that as well. Next slide, please. And I mentioned on the list of services, but some of the Core services that SSPs provide are testing for HIV and hepatitis C. And as of the most recent report, 61% of all registered SSPs in the state were offering testing, which is 120% increase from the start of SSPs in North Carolina. And I will just note that this year, the most recent year does include um, March of this year to the end of June. And so when you see the drop down, that's really represented by COVID and the response that programs have been making because what we've heard is that the majority of SSPs have actually put testing on hold during COVID and focused primarily on syringe and naloxone distribution and other core services such as connecting folks to food and housing. And so that's why there's that dip. But in general, this number has increased um, since the start and it's a really important opportunity to test people and connect them to care. Next slide, please. And I just wanted to summarize some of the key points and you'll definitely hear this throughout the presentations and the panels this morning, but wanted to just end in affirming, reaffirming that SSPs are really critical partners in overdose prevention, infectious disease prevention, and connecting people who use drugs to treatment and care, and really in providing culturally and non-judgmental care through a drug user health lens, and are such critical partners in the work that we're all doing here in the state. And services continue to grow and develop, and you know we've definitely seen an increase in the number of programs, but more than anything, we've seen an increase in the number of services. So just the programs that exist continue to grow and develop and are supporting people <laughs> immensely, um, even as that need continues to grow and it can be challenging at times, which you'll hear a little bit as well some today. But wanna just mention that, you know, the work that has happened in North Carolina to expand access to sterile syringe, um, syringes and injection equipment and naloxone has really been critical through the work that SSPs have done over the past few, four years and even before legalization, but wanted to highlight um, just how important partners uh, SSPs are and I'm excited for you all to hear a little bit more from okay. programs directly about the work that they're doing here in a second. Um, next slide, please. But before we go to that, I wanted to mention one other thing. One of the ways that we support SSPs through the branch in our work at the Division of Public Health is providing training and technical assistance, particularly for new programs or um, community-based organizations that are looking to start certain service programs. And over the past uh, few years, we've offered twice a year a certain service program training academy. And we're excited to announce that next year we're actually expanding this um, training a little bit and making it the first ever harm reduction academy. 
And this is gonna be taking place starting um, in the beginning of the year and will be a six month program that will provide training on harm reduction to programs or individuals who are doing work to support people who use drugs, whether it's in certain service programs or if you're doing work in post overdose response or justice involved strategy work. So we wanted to just make sure you're aware of this opportunity. We're gonna be sending out an announcement about this in the next week as well. Um, but my colleague Megan also shared the link to this in the chat box and this is the, the official launch of it. So you have an opportunity to check out the application if you're interested and share with colleagues as well. So next slide. I just wanted to thank you all so much for letting me share a little bit more about the great work that is happening in North Carolina, but really, as I mentioned, want you to hear from programs. But before I transition to Colin, I just wanted to let you know that you can reach out to us if you have any questions, whether it's about the presentation or about the support that we're providing for um, the registration process for syringe service programs or just anything related to the North Carolina Safe for Syringe Initiative. And our website, our, our contact information is on the slide. It's syringeexchangenc at dhhs.nc.gov. And we will be happy to answer any questions you have. So as I mentioned, definitely want to get started with the first panel. And I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Colin Miller, who's our harm reduction consultant and also co-founder of an SSP in Winston-Salem to, to get us started with this conversation. So Colin, I'll turn it over to you. And thanks for getting us started. Great. Thanks, Alyssa. Um, so um, we have a great panel today. And what we'd really like to do is dig into some of the different innovations that we've seen uh, North Carolina syringe service programs uh, employ or take um, in, in, in recent years uh, or in, in, in the, the past year or so. Um, so what we'd really like to start with is um, we've got a great panel of people. So I'll start by uh, going through and letting folks uh, introduce themselves. Uh, we have Michelle Mathis. So we'll start with Michelle. If you could introduce yourself and just say uh, the organization you work with and a little bit about what you do. There we go. I'm Michelle Mathis. I'm the executive director and co-founder of Olive Branch Ministry. Uh, we are faith-based harm reduction in, based in the Piedmont Foothills area of North Carolina, and we serve nine counties uh, up and down Highway 321 and then um, across I-40. Uh, we uh, have several overdose response teams, SSPs, and um, are now involved in some uh, kind of cutting edge stuff with HCV treatment and low barrier uh, MAT. Thank you, Michelle. And next we have Lauren Kessner from Queen City Needle Exchange. Um, I oversee the Queen City Needle Exchange program based out of Charlotte, North Carolina. This is a program of the Center for Prevention Services, which is a longstanding nonprofit uh, in Charlotte, and we've been here for about 50 years. We expanded into harm reduction services about three years ago and have been providing throughout Mecklenburg and Davidson County. Um, we have some really exciting stuff that we've been doing, and um, as mentioned earlier by Alyssa, we've really just been focused on our priority right now, but I'm happy to be here and happy to join everyone. Thanks so much. Thanks, Lauren. And uh, lastly, but not leastly, we have Mr. Jesse Bennett from NCHRC. Uh, Jesse Bennett, Harm Reduction Program Manager for North Carolina Harm Reduction Coalition. Uh, NCHRC operates seven syringe exchanges across the state, uh, as well as uh, linkage to care program, hepatitis C, HIV testing, and a whole other umbrella of services. Thank you, Jesse and the panelists for those introductions. And uh, so when we're talking about the last year, we would be remiss to, talk, uh, to not talk about uh, COVID-19. And um, there's been a lot of changes in the way that uh, harm reduction outfits, syringe service programs uh, have had to change the way that they've delivered services during COVID-19 to help ensure the, the safety of the participants of the programs, as well as the staff and volunteers of the programs. 
Um, so I know with Twin City Harm Reduction Collective, uh, which is the program that I run in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, um, during COVID, we basically shut down our uh, direct, you know, our actual uh, fixed site location and expanded our delivery hours and took on basically all our clients as, as delivery clients or delivery or, you know, basically was delivering to all our participants. And um, now we've sort of shifted and reopened our fixed site and are doing sort of more of a, cur a curbside delivery kind of model. Um, we've been distributing a lot of PPE and such and tons and tons of hand, hand sanitizer, which uh, at some times has been hard to come by because it's been on back order, uh, at least in the earlier days of COVID it was. Um, so there's been a lot of different things that, um, that, that programs have done to sort of, you know, um, mitigate the harms or, or potential harms of, of COVID-19. So as sort of a starting place, I'd like to go down the line and sort of hear from the panelists about um, what sort of changes have they employed during COVID-19? How have they uh, kept their people safe, uh, both as far as participants and staff and volunteers? And uh, what, how does uh, service delivery, or how has service delivery looked during COVID-19? And we can start with uh, Jesse. Sure. So. Um... So for our wake exchange, uh, nothing really changed. Uh, we're primarily mobile based. Uh, we have, we run an office exchange uh, twice a week out of here. And um, at first we kind of shut down the office uh, and uh, went strictly to mobile. And it was, that was the same in Wilmington, uh, with the, which is primarily office based. Um, and we had to go, you know, kind of, we just shut everything down, um, went strictly to mobile exchange, but we never, um, we never paused services, not once. Um, we did have to pull back from uh, HIV hep C rapid testing for a bit. Um, and so we just started getting that going back. And then when we decided to open uh, our office exchanges back, uh, kind of had, you know, uh, only allowing uh, certain people, so certain number of people in at a time, masks are mandatory uh and and really just trying to um you know distribute masks to participants uh you know uh hand sanitizer all that good stuff so we never had a hiccup in services um we just really had to adjust it um and you know kind of like everybody else great and uh michelle you next um, for us, we had some of the, you know, same challenges I think all the SSPs did um, in that how do we keep staff safe, how do we keep our participants safe, but still deliver services um, at, um, you know, qual with quality and integrity. So it looked different for our different locations. Um, one thing that we did notice across the board is that um, syringe services um, greatly increased in demand that the, the need for fentanyl test strips and um, the need for um, naloxone really, really increased um, over the last six months. And we attribute that to um, a, you know, further pollution um, and um, in the drug supply that folks are seeing. So um, we had to accommodate for that. So that meant, you know, moving some money around to make sure that we had adequate um, you know, supplies to accommodate that. But for um, two of our locations, we're in integrated settings. So we're within treatment facilities. And um, both of those facilities shut their buildings down to anybody except for staff. So um, that allowed us then to migrate people to a parking lot um, uh, delivery. So they come, they call us, tell us what we, what they need, and then we just deliver it to them in the parking lot. Now that the buildings have opened back up, we have found that that is a lot more successful um, in that we're able to have more open conversations and folks are more comfortable bringing additional people if they're not having to, um, you know, come in and walk in the halls. So we're, we're continuing that in those locations. Um, for a rural, very rural county like Cleveland County, um, we have seen a big demand in our mobile uh, because we also serve Rutherford County. Um, and so between that and Lincoln County, we've seen a big increase in mobile. And so 
you know, making sure that we have, you know, staff available to be able to do that um, has been important. And then in Hickory, the a big thing that impacted us, one was um, pulling back, although we never stopped all the way, pulling back on our um, HCV testing. Um, and then also having to stop in-person support groups like our Medication Assisted Recovery Anonymous. So we migrated folks attending support groups to online resources until we could hopefully start those back up in November. Great. Oh, let me say one more thing too that also that we had to stop was our in-person jail-based education. So because we're not allowed to go into the jails, but we have kept that up through our pen pal program. Um, continuing to send resources um, to our folks that are in jail. Awesome. Thanks, Michelle. It's it's interesting to hear how how things have been different from from county to county and from area to area. It's awesome that you guys have had the flexibility to to, to really kind of cater services in that way. So thank you. And next we have uh, Lauren Kessner. <coughs> Hi. <clears throat> I echo a lot of what's been shared. We were up against um, similar challenges across the board. For us, we have um, we had three partnered locations throughout Charlotte and all of them shut down. So we transitioned immediately. Well, right when um, shelter in place was declared, um, we were able to access the site we have open on Fridays. And we stocked everybody up and we made sure that anybody that we could reach that day on site or anybody through mobile before we had to, you know, shelter in place, that they had supplies for roughly a month and they could get through. Um, we did not stop services. I mean, we were still out doing mobile. Um, we have Hope Chapel, which is over by the men's shelter, which is uptown Charlotte. We have another one with Carolina's Care Partnership and that's, um, a medical center that works with people living with HIV. And then we were at Anuvia briefly, but there were um, some barriers with that particular location, as there are with some of the other um, ones as well that we're learning now um, since COVID. So we've been through a lot of transition, but I think mobile has been the most consistent thing that's just worked for everybody. And we've continued to um, just take it day by day. We do provide other services that have been discussed, linkage, but you know, with all the disconnection, especially early on, like it was said, no testing, everything was disbanded. Um, so we just really heavily focused on getting people syringes, biohazard, naloxone, you know, all the really, really essential stuff, which we do, and we really ramped up wound care aid. We um, started providing more in bulk. We've offered alternatives because we've just seen really um, bizarre upticks in like MRSA and other things due to the cross-contamination of the drug supply. So um, we really, really had a much better lens, honestly, on the ground with COVID because, you know, they, we did supply drops that were socially distanced um, initially and for a couple of months. But as we phased out, and really just as we needed to connect with our program members and how our program members needed to connect with us, um, you know, we really, you know, just with masks and six feet of separation, we had much more um, dialogue and conversation just out in the open over the summer and into the fall, which is just what we've continued. Um, we are opening a new space. Um, we um, are really excited about it. So we're gonna see that open hopefully early December. And that is where we'll be able to provide more comprehensive linkage. But you know, this holistic wellness center is really essential SSP services, peer support, um, you know, all kinds of creative activities um, that we're really excited about. So as we move forward, we're seeing um, some balance, like the fixed sites pre-COVID offered Mecklenburg County, um, especially Mecklenburg County. We serve Davidson County as well, but it offered a healthy balance for program members and for staff. You know, it really alleviated the mobile burden because it's very, very difficult to sustain. And Davidson is just off the charts right now. We're, you know, we've enrolled upwards about 80 program members. We're all mobile out there. So it's just rural and, you know, we're not doing it much differently than what's been discussed already. So. Yes, we continue on and um, we just ebb and flow with everything else. 
Colin, can I add something else um, to that? Um, so also in terms of COVID and COVID testing for um, staff and outreach workers, um, our outreach workers get tested every two weeks um, as testing became available. Um, and, you know, like Wilmington, uh, there was an exposure there. And so we had, you know, we had our, my whole Wilmington staff had to be quarantined. So um, we had to make adjustments um, with volunteers to, you know, kind of pick up the slack down there. And um, luckily here in Raleigh and other places, we haven't um, had any positive cases and no one, you know, even though they had um, exposure, no one came back positive there. And so um, I feel really, you know, good and confident about, you know, the steps we're taking to keep ourselves safe, um, as well as our participants. Um, I'd also like to add an important note that I had actually notated here to mention. Our peer exchange efforts really ramped up, which was um, really, really cool to see. We had, um, we have an awesome volunteer out in Davidson County who has a tremendous reach, and we've got four other volunteers here in Mecklenburg County, all of which we support through monthly stipends. And they, I mean, they're, you know, they, we rely on them for everything in this program and they have really um, shown up and rallied with us to help make sure that people who otherwise would not have access to this exchange program or other bordering county programs, um, they're getting what they need. That's awesome. Some great stuff going on in the state. And uh, to talk about some other great stuff going on in the state, um, this is gonna be to Michelle. Um, so we know that uh, co-locating services and bringing the things that people uh, really need to the places where they actually are is really critical in removing barriers and uh, expanding access to care. Um, so if you could tell us a little bit about the low threshold BUP and uh, hepatitis C treatment pilots that you're doing with Olive Branch and uh, what have you seen with these programs so far if they're uh, off the ground or sort of what's the, where, what's the status on those? I would love to. Um, I think it's one of the things I'm most excited about right now. So we started our hep C treatment um, testing and treatment program in uh, February, so right before COVID kicked off. And we did this by um, hosting hep C treatment or testing parties at people's homes. Um, so we would, you know, work with our participants and carry pizza or Taco Bell or whatever we needed to do. Um, and we would test, you know, anywhere from six to, you know, eight people um, at one location, or it might just be, you know, two or three, depending. Um, so we would do rapid tests for HIV and um, hep C, and then if they were uh, came back reactive, then we would uh, do blood draws. Um, our, we have a nurse practitioner who's volunteered with us for a number of years. His name is Tim. He's amazing. Um, in fact, he's our only volunteer in the whole organization. Um, and so he um, works for an FQHC, federally qualified um, healthcare um, facility. And so uh, his primary job there is HCV treatment. So he um, offered to bring this into us. We partner with the FQHC. The, um, our participants um, who want to enter into treatment for their hep C or their um, suboxone um, actually become patients of um, the FQHC, but they never have to go there. They either, we either carry the medication um, for their hep C treatment to their homes, or they can come by our center and pick it up, or we can meet them wherever they are. If they're unhoused um, or shelter challenged, then we can meet them wherever is comfortable and safe for them. They never have to go into a clinic, um, so they don't have, suffer the stigma that they normally would. We already have a built-in relationship with them because of peer support through syringe access. And um, they're comfortable with us because they know us. So um, with, with us starting in February, we've had a total number of um, chronic HCV patients um, was 32. 19 of those actually started treatment, several self-cleared. And um, we're excited about that because almost 75% of those who engaged in treatment have either completed it or are currently on treatment. So that to me is amazing. And these are folks who would never have darkened the doors of a clinic. And some of these folks knew that for 
five, 10 years that they were HCV positive, and now they have this opportunity within 60 days to be cleared of their hepatitis. So we're very just so excited about that. Um, and that program, we are still testing and still enrolling people. Um, and then something that we started um, about a month and a half ago um, is low barrier Suboxone. Again, in partnership with the FQHC. So these folks do become patients of the FQHC, but they never have to go there. Um, if they're part of our syringe exchange program, and we're limiting to it to that right now because um, one, this is our first year doing this. So, um, and first year for Tim to be doing this. So we're limited to the 20 participants at one time. So if somebody falls off, we can add somebody in, but a total of 20. Um, that being said, um, we filled up within our first about three and a half weeks um, to the, our max capacity. And we're, we have the syringe exchange participants because we have that um, relationship with the individuals. So we're not asking people when they come in, hey, do you want to get on Suboxone? We're waiting for them to approach us because we, we're not pushing that, but we know that when people are ready, they often don't have the resources for it. And the word has spread. I mean, I'm getting literally every day calls from providers in the area who said, I heard that y'all have low barrier Suboxone. Can we enroll people in your program? No. <laughs> you know, we're keeping it very limited and, and the program's full. Um, but we do not pay for the Suboxone, but we are using um, a pharmacy that has, um, you know, cost savings. And then with GoodRx, people pay $22 to $32 a week for their Suboxone prescriptions. What makes this low barrier? Again, we're meeting people where they are. They never have to go to a clinic. Um, we encourage them to attend the online Mara group until we get ours started back up again. Um, We'll also be starting next week a harm reduction works or next month a harm reduction work support group um, as well. Um, and so folks can come to that, but it is not a requirement. We are drug testing randomly um, once a month. However, we're only testing for the Suboxone. So we're not testing for any other chemicals that are in somebody's system because that's really none of our business. We just want to make sure that that um, the Suboxone isn't being diverted. And that's per the integrity of the program with the FQHC. Um, most folks, when you enroll in a Suboxone program, you get drug tested every week and you're required to go to all these classes and all this kind of stuff. But our peers check in with our uh, Suboxone uh, participants on a, um, on a weekly basis and we're available all the time if somebody needs to call to talk to us. So um, we're super excited about that. I think we're the first um, SSP in the state to do that. And um, we're just thrilled. And we can't wait until next year when we can open it up to more of our participants. Thank you, Michelle. I'm super excited to hear how low barrier it's going to be and, and how accessible it's going to be for folks. I mean, that's, that's really, uh, man, <laughs> long time coming and super needed. So thank you so much for all the work y'all are doing with Olive Branch. Thank you. So next we'll, uh, we'll go on to uh, Jesse. So Jesse, uh, NCHRC has uh, a number of SSPs across the state. Can you just share some of the innovations that, that y'all have made in your programs and partnerships you are expanding uh, to support the people you serve in a comprehensive way, like the food pantry and stuff like that? Sure, so um, I guess I'll start in Wilmington first. Um, in Wilmington, we are piloting a um, drug user health hub which um, is similar to a um, you know, federally qualified health clinic only um, run out of a harm reduction agency and um, syringe exchange program. And um, we'll be piloting a, a, a low barrier BUP um, project out of that um, uh, here probably the, by the first of the year. Um, and then moving on in, into uh, Raleigh, uh, we are we're piloting piloting a um, food pantry out of our exchange here, um, in partnership with the um, Food Bank of Eastern North Carolina. And uh, what what that entails is um, you know. Uh, you know, when, when we think of the hierarchy of needs of like food, shelter, clothing, right, right at the bottom, um, we found when we were running our process evaluation that um, our, you know, our participants were struggling to, um, you know, 
plan meals throughout the day, things like that. And so um, what this allows us to do is um, provide, um, you know, some type of um, meal or, you know, kind of bridge between meals. Um, but it's not just uh, for our participants. Um, anybody from the community can come in and access our pantry. Um, so it's been, it's been actually pretty interesting uh, watching other community members come in to our exchange um, and kind of understand what else is going on here. Um, so um, that's, a, that that's been a pretty big, pretty good partnership. And then um, out in Haywood County, um, they really focus on, um, you know, unsheltered or unhoused populations. So um, we were able to secure funding to um, house individuals out there during um, COVID at, um, at at the hotel that they had out there, and um, and kind of with when COVID hit and um, people were being housed in, in the hotels in other places, um, we kind of partnered with other agencies that were, um, that were providing outreach to those areas. Uh, so we could provide services to people who use drugs that um, were going there and kind of, um, I think it was this, people were like, oh my gosh, we need to house all these people. And then they housed them. And then they're like, well, there's a lot of people using drugs here and they were trying to kick them out. And we're like, well, you can't do that. <laughs> it was just this crazy thing. So able to go in there and kind of educate um, and provide services that other agencies weren't able to do. Um, so, so that's been really good. Um, you, know, you know, we also provide a lot of technical assistance to other um, exchanges and health departments throughout the state um, and, and, you know, kind of providing technical assistance with um, QCNE, for example. Um, and so, so, uh, so yeah, we, our exchanges have a lot of um, other things happening within them, which is really good because I like to see, you know, part of the, the issue with people in syringe exchange is this idea that, you know, we're just giving out syringes or we're just enabling. So being able to, um, you know, kind of show the, the umbrella of services that we offer that aren't just, uh, you know, it's not just giving out syringes or just doing testing, right? We're providing um, a whole array of services all the way, you know, all comprehensive from beginning to end, so. Great, thanks, Jesse. And lastly, Lauren, um, you talked a little bit earlier about the, uh, the harm reduction wellness and education center that you guys are opening. Can you maybe expound just a little bit on that and then we can get into some Q&A? Sure. Um, the easiest thing to start with there though is, um, you know, we're still very much in our infancy as a program. Um, you know, Jesse alluded to he, um, the TA that the NCHRC has provided and Jesse's actually, um, working with us on a, our first peer on evaluation. So that's really allowing us for the first time to really hear the voices of those we serve. I mean, we have these great interactions and dialogues, but with COVID, we've been so disconnected. Um, and even with the engagements, they've just looked and felt very different. So it's really awesome that we have these things happening at the same time. So we're really able to hone in on what our program members really want to see us improve, you know, where we're meeting the need, where we're not. And, That'll help us really develop um, how people have, you know, first and foremost, syringe access at the new center and what other healthy diversions, um, you know, will be appropriate to bring in. So um, that said, I mean, there's a slew of opportunity that we're really excited about. I mean, the new space is a home, so it, you know, is very comfortable for, um, and it's very inviting. There'll be a prep station, you know, it'll have the opportunity to engage with program members, volunteers, you know, other community members that really want to come in and just learn about, you know, what we do directly on the ground. Um, we, um, we have so much going on, but I don't really know like where it'll land. So, you know, from the peer evaluation surveys um, in December, probably, we're also partnered with Duke to start the telemed um, project, which will offer program members um, buprenorphine in conjunction with PrEP. And that's a first. It's also our first research initiative, um, you know, in collaboration with the Duke University. So, yeah, we, um, I mean, and program members are really excited about that, too, because, you know, especially with COVID, you know, people who have just 
desperately wanted to access MAT or detox or other services, you know, we've been able to talk about this program and not that we are like saying, wait, you know, we're trying to get them connected where we can, of course, um, but they're still hitting a lot of barriers. So it's nice that we're able to work with our partners and develop these really low threshold engagements for our program members. Um, we'll be able to have a consult room, which will provide um, low barrier testing services. We work really closely with Mecklenburg County Health Department and other local um, community-based partners. Um, we're pursuing new relationships as well. And um, we are also excited for like the horticultural benefit of this new space. It has um, a really awesome backyard. So there's like a, you know, we, we have the intention of building a community garden that'll really engage everybody seasonally, of course. <laughs> Um, creative expression will be a really big part of this. I mean, this is really going to be a holistic space. So even with, you know, the partners that we have that'll be offering some of the more clinical provisions, um, we really want to stay very true to um, just the refuge that this can offer those who just need a space. And, um, oh, and our newest partner is with the Arts and Science Council. And that's really cool for me because I'm actually an illustrator by trade. So being able to bring um, harm reduction, public health and the arts, you know, into the conversation here is really exciting. So we have a storytelling process through Voto Voice that we've partnered with the Arts and Science Council on. And that is, um, again, just kind of going to unfold organically in the spring. We're going to have a public, um, well, COVID contingent, you know, virtual or in person, but hopefully we'll figure something really awesome out. And any proceeds that we receive, you know, if work that people want displayed that they've done over the process of this project, you know, those are things that we can directly give back to them. So, you know, helping to meet their needs, what they want, you know, this, everything we have going on is entirely participant driven, which is just cool. And, you know, an opportunity for us to step back and just see where they want to lead us. Sounds awesome. Thanks, Lauren. Yeah. All right, so we have like eight minutes left, so we'll launch right into our Q&A. And there is a question that was asked um, in the chat. And the question is essentially getting at some uh, issues around serving folks that are unhoused. Um, so the question is, uh, in my county, public health and housing services changed for people without homes, e.g. increased outreach, moving shelters to hotels, etc. It was described to me once as all of a sudden everyone cares about homeless people. How has that impacted syringe services for unsheltered people? And uh, I'll just say really quickly, I know with TCHRC, there was a couple hotels in town where they did move a number of uh, unhoused people from uh, encampments and it actually made services really easy because everyone was in one place. <laughs> you know, there was a couple different hotels in town that were just, you know, chock full of uh, people that, that were uh, thankfully, you know, uh, given, given rooms there and uh, were able to get off the streets or out of their little tents or whatever. And uh, it was it, it, it actually made services for us really easy because we could just go and sort of drop off stuff for, you know, eight or nine different people or even more than that at some hotels. Um, so that that's been our sort of experience briefly. But uh, any of the panelists feel free to reply to that. Yeah, I was going to jump in and say, um, well, QCNE, and especially one of our um, outreach workers, Danae Ayers, she had she was um, Each Life Has a Place was where we ran one of our sites out prior to having the shutdown when the pandemic um, hit. And she has always worked um, very closely with the homeless community here. So we have established really great partnerships with um, ELAP and Watchmen of the Streets. So again, we weren't really taking on too much more because Connect Mech with Kindness and some of these other initiatives have so much focus already on what was going on with our homeless community and what was happening with displacement and other um, really aggravated circumstances since COVID. Um, <clears throat> but we, we do um, and have always, you know, provided the care that we can. We support with tents, we support with food, and we'll always work with our partners to get um, as much as we can because we are seeing a major shift. I mean, everybody really is at capacity. There were a lot of motels and hotels. Um, it's um, shifting a bit right now, but um, people still, you know, do have residence in a lot of these places, um, which is good. 
but there are going to be some evictions. So we're, we're still waiting for the other shoe to drop here. So we're trying to <clears throat> stay very on radar with it so that we can support the partners that are already doing the work. Um, I just like to say, um, Amy, I don't know what county you're in, but I wish we had that kind of initiative in our counties. Um, what we have seen is people have been further displaced, um, not just because of COVID, but also because of a lot of gentrification that's going on. Um, sports arenas being built, um, you know, downtowns being revitalized, and they're truly pushing uh, folks that are already on the edge to, to further, you know, um, further out. Um, but we have accommodated for that by, um, you know, as we've been able in increasing, um, you know, mobile deliveries in certain counties where we've seen that to be an issue. Um, but we already had um, really good relationships with um, a lot of the tent cities that are set up. Um, even those, those have become quite mobile now. Um, we do hotel, you know, outreach or motel outreach. Um, but it is it has become more difficult and especially in rural areas where um, there's not a lot of pockets of folks. Folks are, um, because it's very noticeable, um, folks are extremely spread out. Um, and so um, it's still a challenge that we're trying to, to overcome. Uh, we've not seen um, a great increase um, in the areas that we serve in people wanting to house folks with shelter challenges. Yep, and I already touched on it. Yeah, yeah, I was about to say, Jesse, Jesse already kind of covered that. Um, next question, um, how has volunteer engagement changed with COVID? What support do you need? I can, I can jump in on that one. Um, so it, it changed a lot with us. Um, so we rely really heavily on volunteer, um, you know, services to make naloxone kits. Um, you know, we, have, we provide naloxone to almost every community-based organization that operates needle exchange. We have volunteer distributors all throughout the state. Um, and so uh, in lieu of having kit making parties, which, you know, I really thrive, you know, I really survived on have, you know, making lots of kits, you know, every month. Um, we've had lots of volunteers coming and picking up supplies from our office um, and, you know, taking it home and making uh, supplies there. Uh, same with, uh, you know, our cottons or our sniff kits, um, you know, people just coming to get the supplies, taking it home, bringing it back. Um, so that's, that's worked out pretty good. Um, you know, I, I would love to get back to the days of having volunteers here, um, but you know, just trying to be extra careful about, you know, everybody's safety. So, um, you know, that's, that's pretty much um, it. And, you know, if people want to volunteer to come pick up stuff to make, I'm more than happy to give you supplies. So come on. <laughs> All right. And we just have about a, a minute left. Michelle or Lauren, did you have anything to add to that? No, I was, I mean, it's the same with us. I mean, if you, if there's people who are interested and they can pick up and go, we're also not hosting much, you know, we hope to see that shift, but um, yeah, just please reach out. <laughs> we can always use the help. All right, great. Well, I'd like to thank our panelists uh, for the great information and for sharing what all their all the work that they're doing. And uh, I guess I'll pass it over to Anna for our next session. Thank you, Colin. I appreciate that. That was a wonderful panel. Um, so next, we're gonna have another great panel with Louise Vincent from the North Carolina Survivors Union and Terrell Gleason from Advocacy House. And they are going to be talking about hey, how they and the groups that they work with advocate um, with people who use drugs and on behalf of people who use drugs. And um, I'm excited. So Louise, we will start with you. Okay, well, hello. Um, it's nice to see everybody. Well, I guess I can't see anybody. So it's nice to be here with you guys. Um, I'm Louise Vincent, and I'm with the North Carolina Survivors Union, and we are what we call a drug user union. Um, lots of people don't know what that means, and that's okay. 
Um, really what that means is we're a community led organization, which means we work with people, we're led and directed by people who, um, who are directly impacted um, by substance, you, you know, by, uh, you know, we use drugs. Um, and so many of us um, have substance use disorder, mental illness, um, people living with HIV, hepatitis C. Um, we are the people who are most affected uh, by, by these policies and by, um, by what's happening, you know, around us right now, uh, which is so complicated and so difficult. Um, one of the things that's really special about uh, North Carolina Survivors Union is the fact that we are led and directed by people who use drugs. Our board is 100% people who use drugs. Um, and we try to hire people that use drugs. And that's people at any stage of the substance use continuum. Um, and so that can mean a lot of different things. And I want to just stop and, and just give like pause to what this means is that we do really difficult work. You know, there's nothing easy about um, working with people at every stage and any stage of the substance use continuum. And on any given day, um, it's really tricky and really difficult. And that means one of the things that we have to do is we have to do a ton of leadership development and professional development. And so one of the things I want to talk about today is um, one, of the, one of the big initiatives that we took on this year, even with, um, even with COVID, we decided to go ahead and do it, um, which is our Advocacy Academy, which I believe has been hugely successful. So Advocacy House and North Carolina Survivors Union worked together to develop what we're calling an Advocacy Academy. Um, and, and what this is, is this is a place for people who are impacted to get involved and really learn how to be professionals, learn how to um, really engage in these systems, in these public health systems, in the, in the mental health systems, really learn how to, how to, you know, how to write a bi biography, how to have a curriculum vita, how to, how to have the things we need so that we can go speak at, um, speak at, 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 at places like this, right? so that we can build our, our knowledge base and we can learn how to better work with the professionals who really need to learn from us, right? Because so many times we find um, folks doing this work, doing it on behalf of us, and that doesn't always speak to what we need, right? It really needs to come from our voice. We really believe this. And so Advocacy Academy started right when, um, COVID-19 really, um, really, um, I mean, I think it was the week of, and so it, it was supposed to be an in-person um, training and it, it was a number of weeks long and we had to turn this over to online um, like within a week. And what was really special about this and really great about this is this provided all of our folks some skill sets that they very much need right? We are having Zoom meetings all day long, all the time now. And I think our folks are some of the best at, at doing this because of all the practice that they've had. We learned how to uh, host webinars and, 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 and write PowerPoint slides and do all of this stuff. And so this was really great. I mean, this is one of the, this is one of the real gifts that, um, that, that we are, that, that, that by understanding what we're lacking, right? Because we've worked in this community for so long, we know how to bring people in. And if we don't, then what happens is we have meetings all over the state all the time um, where people are talking about what needs to happen for people that use drugs, but nobody there um, uses drugs and nobody there really under, or, or if they do or did, they don't use drugs right now. And, you know, I've heard a couple of things this morning that are really great. And one of the things that, that we know is that the landscape has changed. And so if you're not in the, in the world right now using drugs and, and, and having to operate in these systems, then you don't know what people are dealing with, right? Because we have a drug supply that's contaminated. We have all of these, we have all of these issues happening. Um, that, that really impact people in different ways. Now, 
one of the things that that we found really, you know, one of the things that's been really special is we brought in Advocacy Academy. And we did this um, early on because we had an experience a year before where we were doing testing for hepatitis C and HIV and we had folks coming in and they were getting tested for, for hepatitis C and they weren't getting tested for HIV. And um, really quickly, we discovered that they were scared to be tested for HIV and they, there was all this stigma surrounding HIV. And what we know is that um, these, these services are siloed in North Carolina, right? A lot of the SSPs are not providing um, comprehensive HIV services, Ryan White and all that. Um, and so because of that, we were really not talking about HIV in the new science and all of the things that accompany, um, um, you know, that entire piece of knowledge. And so we worked with Advocacy House. And so part of what we did is we worked with two communities that are two groups that are community led and community directed. And we taught each other. And this was really special and truly impactful. And I believe that the folks that were involved really walked away um, knowing how to better and be more equipped to, um, to, to participate and teach and engage in the community, which is what we need. Um, I, I think uh, Terrell's gonna talk a little bit more about that when he speaks, and so I wanna leave room for that. But another thing that I wanna touch on is that we are community organizers. Our theory of change at North Carolina Survivors Union has to do with the fact that we are community, organi community organizers who are providing direct services because we have to, because our folks are dying. And, um, and so it's really important that we're working with our folks on, on the things that are impacting them right now. And what we know is that methadone clinics are impacting folks right now, not being able to get in methadone clinics, not being able to, to work through these hurdles, not being able to get around these huge barriers and not being able to get access to, to the services they need to be okay. Um, and so understanding what those barriers are, understanding what folks need and how we can better help. And, and I'm hoping that through being at meetings like this and talking at meetings like this, that, that folks can work together to better build or rebuild um, a coalition led and directed by people that use drugs and people living with um, HIV and hepatitis C and the people who are most impacted by these issues, um, we can truly provide the services that we need to provide so that folks can be okay. I mean, we are trying to um, use words like drug user health hub instead of SSP services because we know we can't just be providing people syringe services, right? Um, our folks have told us this. We know that if we don't see our folks until they are injecting, then um, we've, you know, people, people get hepatitis C within the first six months of injecting. And so if, if they're injecting by the time they come to us, they're already infected with hepatitis C. And we want prevention. We want to reach people, all people that use drugs. We want to reach all people that are impacted by the war on drugs and, and, and really try to provide them with, with opportunities. Um, and one of the big opportunities we provide them with is employment. And I think um, one of the things I really wanna to touch on today is there's different ways we can engage with, with people, but there is nothing like providing somebody an opportunity to be part of something, to engage, these are our credentials, and um, I took your word, Terrell. These are our, you know, we, we, we understand um, this world, and harm reduction has got to be more than a public health intervention. Harm reduction is human, human rights and, and, and racial justice and disability justice, and we're just not doing a good enough job. We're just not doing this the way we, we could be doing it. If we were really engaging, and uh, I, I provided a, a handout, and I don't know whether... Um, I sent it to Alyssa this morning, so I hope she got it, and maybe you guys can get it. Um, I provided a handout that just talks about some of the strategies for, for meaningful engagement and working with people that use drugs and, and, and how this works. And, you know, I understand not all groups can employ us. Not all groups can, can have all of the issues that may come 
with working uh, with folks that are living with all sorts of complicated factors, but there's different ways to do this. There's different ways to do it. And there's, um, and, I, and I think Terrell's gonna touch on some of those ways to do this. Um, but the important thing is that we do it and that we, um, that we do it, we talk to the folks that know how to do it and, and, we, and we try different strategies. We don't give up as soon as it gets hard because it is messy. Thanks, Louise. Um, and Terrell, we will now move to you and hear about um, your advocacy work. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Terrell Gleason. Um, I'm involved with Advocacy House, which is in Greensboro, North Carolina. Um, we started out as a group of 12 people living with HIV, um, looking to do advocacy work with what information we have. Um, the HIV community is strong um, and we wanted to move more of that to the ground level in the community. And so what we value, as Louise said, is our credentials are what connects us to our communities. Um, if we um, are living with HIV, if we've had hepatitis C, if we were formerly incarcerated, wherever we are um, to reach other community members has been our strength. Um, when the Advocacy Academy opportunity came up, um, 90, over 90% 90 of the people involved with, ad, advocacy, with Advocacy House um, are either current or former drug users. Um, personally, I lived with hepatitis C, uh, contracted it from, in, from injecting, and I was cured of that in 2015. Um, a lot of people, the percentages were higher before the cure, but a lot of people who were living with HIV were also living with hepatitis C. So with them already being in healthcare, they had better choices to cure their hepatitis C as I did. We were already in the systems. Um, but with the, with the, and working with the drug users, a lot of people, including myself, uh, HIV came around my world because of drug use. And so there's a little bit of fear in the HIV advocacy community of people who use drugs. We're fearful we're gonna, you know, um, object ourselves to things and maybe do some things we don't want to do. And so we learned that with working with the drug users, there seemed to be nobody more stigmatizing than the drug using community. And then we were really surprised to learn that the drug using community, they were scared of our HIV. They didn't want to know about any testing, that this is what they felt most stigmatized about. So instantly we tore down those barriers and we learned from each other. And because the people using drugs, you know, and I don't want to use this as a step up for someone to contract HIV, but they didn't realize the advantages that people living with HIV have when it comes to housing. We get moved to the front of the line because if we don't have stable housing, we can't take our medication. Um, they learned about um, things like um, the ADAP program that as a last resort, if you can't get your medicines and healthcare for HIV, you can get it there. So a lot of that stuff came out. And, uh, and we're looking on moving that stuff forward. Um, and I guess that's really, that's where we are. We're also about employing ourselves. Um, we're all about advocacy when it comes around policy. We have been effective at the legislative level. We have been effective at the congressional level. Um, and we, we have a voice and we're all about employing us. Yes, we, we want our allies. But part of this whole process is employing and paying us and creating our own value because we feel that we are the solutions uh, to a lot of these epidemics. And uh, thank you for your time, everybody. Wonderful. Thanks so much, um, Terrell. Um, and I know that we wanted to have um, more of a discussion um, about breaking down silos. And um, Terrell, you did a great job of, of talking about the silo that had existed between people who use drugs and people living with HIV and hepatitis. Um, and you, you um, hinted about the fact that 
folks with HIV have been really successful in their advocacy and you talk about housing and, and access to medications. Um, can you talk about, um, you know, what you see for people who use drugs in terms of how can they learn from the advocacy that's happened um, by people who are living with HIV? Um, how can we transition to the folks who use drugs having the types of successes that the people living with HIV have had? Thank you. It's already happening. Um, and, and parts of the way uh, that that is happening is look at the 340B program. You know, the 340B program now is cover, covers hepatitis C treatments. That was not the intent of, you know, that part of the 340B program. It was only for HIV medications. So I feel that it's basically just taking some of those federal programs and implementing, you know, the drug using community. Um, there's also, um, with the housing, you know, that was a real big fight uh, through HOPWA. Uh, that's a federal program. And to me, it's, it's the people sharing their stories with people who make decisions in policy. I mean, we've always been taught to share our story because chances are you're gonna get in, in front of a legislator or a congressperson and they've never met anybody that's living with HIV. They've never met anybody that's an IV drug user. And the stigmas that they have with our personal stories and what we're trying to do, those barriers are broken down. Um, so I see that the drug using community has an opportunity to do that, as does the hepatitis C community. Um, the numbers that, that I want to bring up are, I'm feeling there's 37,000 people in the state that are living with HIV. Uh, hepatitis C, those numbers are off the roof. I feel there's a lot of room for a patient or advocacy hepatitis C coalition that rolls over into the drug using community and that our legislators need to be educated at the federal and state levels to open up some of these programs. And the one last thing that I'll say about us unifying is um, um, the national um, I'm, I'm drawing a blank, but the United States Conference on AIDS that was held in 2019, their theme that year was ending both epidemics, the overdose epidemic and the HIV epidemic. So really we're just bringing national information home to Greensboro, thanks to Louise, and, and trying to make some change. And I hope that answers what you're asking. Yeah, thanks. Louise, do you have any, um thoughts on that issue of how people who use drugs can learn from, um, you know, the, the decades of advocacy by people living with HIV, um, what the takeaways are from that movement? Sure. I mean, I can't speak to all of them, but I can tell a story about death by distribution and how Advocacy Academy came, showed up with us. You know, we had done limited amounts of, um, advocacy work and protest and boy they came in they knew what they were doing and they got our signs together and you know follow us we know how to do this you know and, and plus this is going to make you feel better at the end of the day you know <laughs> you know we we learned a lot of lessons um you know turl says something and i'm and, and he talks about just turning the dial just a little bit you know, if people would just turn the, you know, the people living with HIV, all they have to do is turn the dial and they can, and they can use it for, for hepatitis C or, and, and people who use drugs. I think there's lessons learned on both sides. I think people have been scared to talk about the fact that they use drugs for fear of, of losing services they have. Right. And so I think that there has been a lot of, a lot of development in, in learning about just talking about, you know, how to speak about the fact that you use drugs and 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 what that actually means and understanding and understanding some of those things but certainly we have learned so much from working with folks living with HIV and and really if i, I mean i can't stress enough how little the folks knew about uh, the new science of HIV they were still living with 80s information um, and i feel like this has got to be the case um, in more than just greensboro 
right? So if I noticed it in such a big way, we noticed it in such a big way, we started writing grants immediately. Yeah, we said, we have a crisis. This is not a one-off. This is a, we're seeing this over and over and over and over again. And so, it, I mean, and then we started talking to the National Union and some of the people running SSPs didn't know. And so then I was really alarmed. And so um, I, I think, it, you know, it, just a quick litmus test of what, what do your folks know? You know, you can find this out really quickly. And, and if they don't know that, that's really important, right? We, a lot of people are avoiding a lot of things, uh, you know, for nothing, you know, you know, there's, there's so much and, and, and just living with stigmatizing information and information that's harmful to people. And, and it has people saying things that are, that are not the way we want folks to talk. Right. I mean, one of the big things we had to do in advocacy Academy was, I mean, we have something where we say, say it ugly. So, you know, we had to just say, look, just say whatever you're trying to say. We're going to assume you're coming from a good place and then we're going to fix it. <laughs> you know, because people were so all over the map in the way they talked about these things and so um, misinformed. And I thought, you know, all the information we were bombarded with about, about HIV and, and, and you feel like you just know everything. And then, and then, you know, People are really, people are really lacking good information. And we are a health hub. We, you know, we provide health services and, and this is related to injection drug use and, and, and drug use. And we need to be talking about it in an informed way. And who better than, than to have a group that, that, you know, can speak to it. So <clears throat> I love the say it ugly idea. I think that's great. I think, you know, over and over again, people are using stigmatizing language without um, intending to use it. And um, I love, I'm just riffing here. I love the idea of um, community groups that are, um, you know, drug coalitions kind of sitting around and having a, a say it ugly session and trying to educate folks on language. But Louise, I wanted to, um, and, and Terrell too, I wanted to ask y'all if, if someone, if we have um, an agency like a health department or a community-based organization, particularly in a rural area in North Carolina, let's say, um, where there's a lot of stigma against people who use drugs oftentimes um, in all, in every county in North Carolina, I don't want to just uh, target um, our rural areas, but I just think it can be especially hard in those areas. Um, if they want to try to involve the voices of, of people who use drugs in an active way in their work, where do they begin? I mean, if, because some folks might not be working with people who use drugs in that way, where would, where would a group even begin to, to start yeah. doing that work? Yeah, this is really fun for me because, you know, we got a call years back from West Virginia from a really, a really great um, health director in a very small town in West Virginia who wanted to do some work with people who use drugs and they were going to have a community day and they had some language picked out about how they were going to get, you know, calling all in intravenous. It was terrible. I mean, I was like, oh yes, we need to take a look at this flyer you're going to put out and change everything. Um, so I think starting with, if you know, community-led groups, right? Then you know where to start, right? Call the people that know. If you wanna work with people who, who are using drugs, then call North Carolina Survivors Union or Urban Survivors Union or one of these groups that is doing this work, Advocacy House. You wanna call somebody that has the expertise. It's just like if you had you know, another issue, I'd wanna call the people that were experts in that, in that area. And we work with people who use drugs and um, work with people who are living with mental illness and work with people and help develop drug user unions. And, um, and now there's a great drug user union in, in West Virginia in that area and they've led actions and many people on this call right now have been a part of that. And so I think, I think it's really about knowing how to get in touch with the folks who are doing it and, and letting them come and help direct the efforts because meaningful engagement is what we, we skip you know, everything is, you know, we look at the list of things we need to do. Okay. We need to go in the community. We need to do this. We need to get folks. We need to pay them. We need to, we need to build trust. 
oh, I don't know, that might take a billion years. Um, or I don't know how you even begin to do that with all the distrust and all the harm. And so that's one of the most important things and one of the most looked over and most misunderstood um, pieces. And so you really wanna work with folks who have access. Um, and, and I wanna say, you know, this isn't always the official sort of peer support specialist. This isn't always, don't, you know, that is one group that works with folks and they do a wonderful job at, at some of the things they do. But there are other groups that do other things and have better reach into some areas. And so we need to, we need to be creative. I think being creative and really um, harm reduction has always been about sort of moving around and looking outside, you know, and going outside the box and um, trying to figure out how to make things work in, in places where things don't work so well. And, and I want to add to that, um, I, you know, you got to create some safe space. You know, if you've got these rural areas, you know, we, we can help you create some safe space. And whether that safe space be in an actual physical location or whether it be on Zoom meetings. And then part of creation of that safe space is really valuing and honoring the people who you're turning to. And by that, I mean paying them. I mean, one of the core values of people living with HIV is that, that we're experts at living with HIV. Number one, we, we were able to face the, the uh, diagnosis of it and still be alive. So in, in valuing that in drug users, it's a challenging thing to do. And I think that's why very few people do it because yeah. it's so challenging to do. You have to really implement your harm reduction principles. But I would really recommend that first of all, developing, developing some trust and some safe space where people can talk ugly, but then we also learn how to talk effective. Right. How do we blend in with these groups? You know, and part of the academy was doing that. I don't have a resume, but I have a CV. So it's, it, so it's just, it's part of that. Okay, I hesitate to ask this question because I know we only have a few minutes left, but um, if you had your wish list of, of policies you know, we're getting into advocacy for particular policies for the state. Um, what would your wish list be? So again, you each only have about 90 seconds or 60 seconds, but what is, what's your bulleted wish list for, for policy change in North Carolina? Louise, I'll start with you. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm, we just talked about this the other day, so I'm pretty good. Um, I know that we need to, um, do something about the the law the ssp law i would like crack pipes and and all of the supplies that we provide at um at, that we should provide you know meth pipes crack pipes everything we need tools of engagement getting rid of the um the paraphernalia law so that would be really good to just eliminate that um i know we talked about um making so getting rid of death by distribution that has to go um some and I know this is federal, but serious methadone reform, like serious, serious methadone reform, to where people could actually access, um, you know, the closest thing the United States is ever going to get to safe supply. And then I think uh, we talked about Good Samaritan provisions, so that the Good Samaritan law is not so so messed up. I would really love it if people could call um, nine one one again and feel free to do that. Um, Instead of instead of all the the death we're seeing again, Terrell. Thanks. Um, I would my wish list is very easy. Everything that people living with HIV receive a benefit <laughs> of people who use drugs should, should also. And then the other one wish list is is the takeaway of any red tape. Um, we we have a transitional challenge if we're get, receiving housing, if we're receiving health care, if we make you know, more than $325 in a month, we might list those benefits. I would like to see a transitional challenge to see people working in the community to actually be more involved and get through those periods where they may be disqualified. Thank you. And I will hand it back to Alan. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate your contribution today. Thank you. Well, trying to get this technology to work, appreciate it. So we're at the end of our time together and I just want to say a couple quick closing words. Uh, again, thank you everybody for joining in. Uh, our goals when we put together the OPDAC meetings is to 
have folks come away and learn something they didn't know. You wouldn't join this group if you weren't concerned about the overdose epidemic. And we have a lot of facets to this. I learned a lot today. So thank you all for so openly and willingly sharing of your time and your talents and your insights very much. And hopefully we can continue the dialogue. I've been monitoring the chat, a lot of good resources shared there. We have a team that puts together the OPDAX. Again, we've evolved from a quarterly to a roughly monthly in-person meeting. We try to make these impactful appointment, appointment type of events. Uh, November is going to be a busy month with holidays and this election thing going on that you might have heard about. So we're taking November off and we're going to pick back up again in December. Our next meeting will be the 11th of December from 10 to 1130. And we're planning to have a justice involved uh, population discussion. We had a really powerful in-person meeting last year about treatment in the detention and corrections facility. We're trying to revisit that topic. And then we don't know when we'll be able to be back in person again. So we're ramping up our uh, 2021 schedule of meetings. If you have topics that you'd like us to touch on, the format we think will be like this for a while. That will be an hour to an hour and a half bring in panelists, give an opportunity to hear what's going on and learn new things. So uh, I'll close here. Thank you everybody again for your time and thank you panelists very much. Bye.